proteins are the miniature machines that carry out all the important jobs in our bodies and in all living things. So basically all the remarkable properties you see of any animal, plant, or anything, those are being mediated by proteins. What we've learned how to do is to design completely new proteins that have new functions. And so now we're working on problems like designing proteins to attack cancers and acting much more specifically and precisely in the body, so be safer and more effective than current treatments. Similarly for autoimmunity, being able to dampen down the immune system where it's gone awry. My colleague Neil, who's in the back, has developed the first um, de novo designed medicine that is in use in humans, uh, a coronavirus vaccine. And his group is designing, making great progress to a universal flu vaccine, for example. Another area that is important in medicine that we're working on, in addition to vaccines, are um, proteins that will neutralize pandemic viruses. And so we're sort of going through the list of the greatest viruses of concern and designing proteins to block them. And some of these are headed for human clinical trials. Um, outside of biology, we're, you know, we're polluting the planet, we're putting a lot of plastic out there and a lot of other toxic things. We're designing proteins that carry out chemical reactions to break down plastic molecules and other uh, pollutants that we're putting into the environment. Uh, we're designing proteins that interact with, with solar radiation to try to increase the efficiency of photosynthesis. And we're designing proteins that, uh, to mediate uh, enhanced carbon fixation. And uh, we're just starting to collaborate with others at the UW to work on the, the methane uh, sequestration problem. There are also huge opportunities for proteins in making new types of materials. Uh, we're familiar with things like bone and tooth and shell, which are made by, from proteins interacting with minerals. And now with protein design, we can make proteins that mediate mineralization and create new interesting materials from, a, from not just things like calcium carbonate and calcium phosphate, but things like semiconductors. Um, so there's a lot of different applications now. I think what really interested me about the problem in the first place is that living things are very different from uh, inanimate things like the just, you know, the rest, the rest of chemistry. You know, you have, you have chemicals which are not alive, and then you have biology things which are alive. Protein, proteins are kind of at the intersection between the two because a protein is just a very large molecule, and so it's very much sort of a chemical sort of thing. It's just a molecule with atom, made out of atoms connected by bonds. But proteins have this amazing, amazing ability to self-organize. They fold up into shapes that kind of have these magical functions. And so it's really kind of the simplest case of biological self-organization. Before our work, the only proteins that we knew about were the proteins that um, we discovered in, in nature. So a lot of molecular biology and a lot of biology over the last probably 100 years has been about trying to find, if you, you're trying to study some biological process like how muscles work or or really anything. It's been about identifying what the proteins are. They're kind of all of these exotic names. And the idea that you could make new ones was kind of a crazy idea. But many engineers in biology have taken proteins that already exist in nature and tried to modify them a little bit to solve a problem. And what, we were, what we've been trying to do is just start completely from, from scratch. And so people said that was a crazy thing to do. And no one thought it was very, um, it, it did, was very much on the lunatic fringe until um, when we start getting better at it, and really this is in the last several years, suddenly it's in the mainstream. And you know, I, companies start all the time and say, we're part of the protein design revolution. And you know, I, <laughs> so when I went to college, I um, actually thought I wanted to be a social studies and then a philosophy major. So it was only kind of late that I switched to biology. In my last year of undergraduate, um, my fourth year as a senior year, I took a biology class and learned about proteins and how they fold up. And I thought that would be a really interesting thing. It was really interesting, but I remember um, you had to write a paper in the class on something. I wanted to write a paper on that. And the TA said, oh, that's way too complicated. No one will ever understand it. So I, I didn't do that. And then, and then um, I got excited about biology though. And I went to graduate school and worked on something completely different. And then, like I said, it was really when I came here that I started working on, on the, the protein folding problem. And then that got us into how to design proteins. Then I had the freedom really here to pursue the science as it developed. And I really, uh, it wasn't like I had a plan. It, you know? <laughs> I've never said, I've always said I can never see more than three months ahead. So.
Can you share what may be next in your work or what you'd like to accomplish next? I think we're really just at the beginning. We figured out how to design new proteins. We figured out how to make them bind to cancer targets, for example, and we're getting better at learning how to um, make them uh, catalyze chemical reactions. So we're, we've really learned a lot about how to design proteins with new functions. So I think now what's tremendously exciting is to look at the vast array of problems that humans face and try and design proteins that solve these problems. There are large numbers of super brilliant, super, super smart, super energetic students and postdocs who are now coming from all over the world to the University of Washington to learn how to design proteins. And each one of them has a problem they want to solve. Uh, for example, Susanna, who came from Mexico, is designing proteins that block the major components of snake venom as a, as a better anti-venom. And students are working on improving um, the efficiency of photosynthesis. So really across the board, there's so many exciting things to do now. So I really do think we're just at the beginning of the impact that, that, that we can have. And is there a single problem that you see kind of rises to the top? You mentioned a few of some of what the students are doing, but is there one that, gosh, if we could just solve this problem, what would that be? Um, you know, I, I kind of I kind of love them all. I mean, they're all. I mean, I, I, I we only work on things that I'm really really excited about. And I think the neat thing about this area now is there's just so much potential across the board. Do you have a dream uh, function uh, for one of the proteins that you could create that would be considered lunatic fringe uh, today? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, one of the things that exists in biology are molecular motors, for example, the way that our, our muscles move. They're, they're little machines that are involved in the contraction and the movement. The way that um, uh, things get organized in our bodies and in our cells is through these very sophisticated molecular machines. So, and what they do is they take a chemical fuel and they break down that fuel, just like kind of a car. It takes, they take a fuel and they use it to, to do something very actively. So uh, the, the newest generation of projects in my lab is to design molecular machines. Now, what could they be good for? Um, well, in, bi in biology, there are machines inside our cells that do quality control and, and are important for removing a lot of the junk that happens during cellular transactions. There really aren't any machines outside of our cells in circulation. But we know that there's all sorts of, you know, junk accumulates in our bloodstream. There's, we get aggregates, we get amyloids forming. So if we could make machines that could go around in the blood and uh, in circulation and basically do cleanup and, and help um, remove toxic tissue, that could be a whole new way of treating disease. So that's one of the sort of more lunaticy fringe that we're working on, things we're working on now. Another, I'll give you one more example. One, and that is we have tooth and bone in our bodies and there's shells and those are proteins interact with minerals. What if we could make completely new types of materials by designing proteins that interact with other minerals and cause, and, and you can imagine all, all kinds of hybrid materials that could be superior in many ways to any of the materials that we have today, including semiconductor materials. So it could be a new way of patterning um, things for electronics. I'd say that still qualifies as lunatic fringe also. I just want to make one last comment, and that's that David's achievement isn't winning the Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize is a recognition of David's achievements thus far. <laughs> the best is yet to come. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.